Hello, everyone, and welcome to Purpose YouTube. My name is Dusty Small, and I'm the lead pastor here at Purpose Church. As many of you know, Purpose Church is a brand new church located right in the heart of Bossier City, Louisiana. We're thankful you're here to watch today's message. Before we get started, would you comment there in the chat section? Let us know your name and where you're watching from. Let me know something you're believing God for right now. Let me know how I can pray for you. And one last thing. As you listen to today's message and God begins to speak to you, would you share some of those thoughts in the chat section? I love to go back and see how God is moving in your life. Sure hope today's message encourages you and your family. Good morning, Purpose Church, and Merry Christmas. We are so excited that you're tuned in with us this morning. And I just want to invite you wherever you are, uh, whether you're home or in your car, uh, just invite God in and just join us in worship this morning.
you that when all seems lost, God, that you come through in your perfect timing, God. You know exactly what we need and when we need it, and you sent Jesus at just the right time. Thank you for sending him so we could have a close relationship with you, and I just pray that we would lift our eyes to you this morning, focus on who you are, remember who you are in Jesus' name.
Well, welcome Purpose Church. We may not be in the building this morning, but we are still Purpose Church. Chantal and I want to wish you and your families a very Merry Christmas. So thankful for technology that this morning you can be home with your families and we can still have a time of worship. We can still have a time of getting into God's Word on this special day. So thankful for what God is doing here at Purpose Church. Well, it's Christmas time, and when I think about Christmas time, I think about Christmas wish lists. I remember early on when my mom would get my brother and my sister and I together, and she would tell us when Christmas was coming, and she would have us write a letter to Santa. I don't know if you ever wrote a letter to Santa and wrote all the little things that you wanted on, but that was a tradition for us every year. And then we would put it in the envelope, and we would mail it off to the North Pole every year. Funny story happened just the other day. My mom gave me a phone call and she said, hey, I reached out to Ariella and told her that I wanted her to send me a Christmas wish list. And she said, Ariella sent me back two pages of things that she wanted for Christmas. You know, we all have a Christmas wish list. We have our prayer list. But I want to begin this morning by asking you, what do you think Jesus would want for Christmas? Think about that for a moment. What does Jesus want for Christmas? Or what about if I ask you this question, what you think Jesus really wants us to know about his birthday? You know, Christmas means a lot of things to many people. But this morning, I want to talk about the purpose in Christmas. And I want to look at how the birth of Jesus teaches us four things about purpose in Christmas. The first purpose of the birth of Jesus is to reveal who God is. In John chapter 1, verse 18, the Bible tells us no one has ever seen God, but the unique one, that's Jesus, who is himself God. He is near to the Father's heart. And look at this. He says, he came to reveal God to us. You know, we have that question, who is God? Who is Jesus? And how do we know who God is? How can we really know a God who seems to be so magnificent, so superior? How can anyone really know who God is? And you know, many people believe in a God, but the opinions are so varying that people get lost in the idea of Jesus. But the purpose of the birth of Jesus is to reveal who God is. Some of those ideologies that we have floating around in our world today. One is called pantheism. You know, pantheism is this idea that all things comprised together make up God. Or you might have heard it said like this, that God is within all things. This is why you might see nature worship or uh, the thought that a tree is actually a God. We also have an ideology called polytheism. And polytheism is the idea of many gods. And this is Hinduism. And then in the Christian faith... We have the thought of monotheism. We get this from the Bible, the Shama, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, that says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And this is monotheism. There's another thought I would share on this, and that is the argument for intelligent design. One of those thoughts is called the teleological argument. And this idea is simply that God is like a watchmaker. So he designed the watch, he put all the intricate parts of the watch together, and then he's kind of aloof from it. So he gets it rolling, gets that watch started, but then he's no longer involved in the day-to-day -day activity of the watch. And so when we put all of this together, what do we make? Who is God? Who is Jesus? What do we believe and where do we land on all this? Well, I go back to the Bible, and the Bible tells us in John chapter 18, verse 37, about the birth of Jesus. It says, I was born... And I came into the world to testify to the truth. You know, that the truth will actually set us free from false ideas and misconceptions. So when we begin to unpack the idea of what are the misconceptions about God, well, one of those misconceptions is that God doesn't care. Does God care about my life? And when I look at the world around me, how can I see that God is caring? Because I look in the world and I see, hey, there's so much suffering. There's so many bad things. If God really cared, why does he allow bad things to happen to good people? Why does he allow evil to persist? Why does he allow the things that we see that just leave us scratching? Surely a God that cares would do something about these situations. Another misconception about God is that God is distant. He's aloof. If God was really with us or if God was really for us, then why does it seem so hard to communicate to God? And when we even think about this grand idea of God himself, how would I even communicate to God? 
Does God care? Does God listen? Is God so far off that we, we can't communicate with him? Another misconception about God is that he's just a condemning God. He's so judgmental and he's just ready to lay the ax to us every time we make a mistake. I'm sure there's times in your life that you've just felt like that every time you do something wrong, God is there to just bring about judgment in your life. Some of those reasons we think like that is how you grew up. Maybe in the home that you grew up in, maybe mother or father was really hard on you and you really didn't get any much affirmation. And every time you made a mistake, it seemed like they were there to point out the mistakes in your life. Anybody ever spill the milk in the morning? Anybody ever spill a drink? And, and immediately, you know, a, a, a father or mother just jumped on us and told, why'd you do that? I can't believe you continue to do this. I've done it with Gabriel. I know there's been times where I would tell him, put your glass behind your plate. He would always leave it by the edge and you know where that's going to go. And so we have these, these misconceptions about God. He doesn't care. God is distant. You know that God is judgmental. God is condemning. But when I look at the birth of Jesus, just simply the birth itself tells me that God does care. God cares enough that he would leave heaven, he would come to earth, take on the form of a man, and he would experience the things that you and I would experience to demonstrate that he cares. See, God, when we look at him in the scriptures, Jesus revealed that God cares about the outcast. God cares about those who've been rejected. God cares about those who are sick. God cares about those who who don't understand or those who are worrisome. God cares about those who doubt. God cares. And I think about it like this when I understand the difference between sympathy, empathy, and compassion. You know, sympathy is when we, we feel sorry for someone. Empathy is more along the lines we feel sorry and we actually, we feel for them. But then compassion is completely different, and this is what Jesus is. See, compassion is I feel sorry, and I feel it, but then I want to take a step to do something about it. And see, God looked down on humanity, and he was moved with compassion. He said, you know what? They're really like sheep without a shepherd. And he decided to come down and make a difference in the world around us. And he did so by what we celebrate today, and that's the birth of Jesus The question that arises, is Jesus near or is Jesus distant? Well, the very fact that he was born tells us that God is near. And Isaiah prophesied that he was Emmanuel, God with us. We also know that not only did Jesus promise to be with us, he'd never leave us nor forsake us, but the book of John tells us that it's to our advantage that Jesus would go away because he wanted to send the helper, the comforter, the Holy Spirit to come reside within each of us. So God is near and God is within us. That final misconception I'd I'd cover really quickly is that Jesus came to save and not condemn. Jesus is not lording over us to just bring the hammer down on us, but we look at John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that who would ever believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God did not send his son in the world to condemn the world, but that the world would be saved through him. The birth of Jesus reveals who God is. And God is a God of compassion. God is a God who is near. God is a God who cares. And we see all of that in Jesus himself. The second purpose of the birth of Jesus is to reveal God's love to us. You know, the Christmas season is really all about Jesus. But, you know, sometimes we misunderstand this. It's also all about us. You see, in God's world, it's all about in us. It's all about us. But in our world, it's all about Jesus. You see, we, say it, we would say it like this. You are the reason for God's season, and God is the reason for our season. When we begin to look at the life of Jesus, when we begin to think about who Jesus is and how he came to reveal love to us, we understand that love is about sacrifice. In the book of John chapter 4, verse 9 and 10, it says, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. What a promise right there. And then in verse 10, because Jesus came into the world, it says, this is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent Jesus, his son, to be a sacrifice and take away our sins. You know, real love gives and it never takes. For God so loved the world that he gave I'm going to repeat that scripture over and over again this morning. Real love gives and it never takes. And God gave. See, real love is both a noun and it's a verb. It's a noun because Jesus is a person. And when we think about love, we know that love is 
a person. For God is love, the Bible tells us. We know it's a verb because it's an action. Jesus demonstrated his own love for us and that while you and I were still a sinner, Jesus died for us. And so to love, like Jesus, means to sacrifice. The third purpose of the birth of Jesus is to reveal God's plan for us. You know, God's plan for us is to redeem and bring restoration. You may not have known this, but actually the Christmas story begins in Genesis. Right when we pick up in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, where it says, For God created man in his image and in his likeness. It goes on to say that he gave us dominion or authority over everything that he created. Did you know that God has given us authority? Did you know that God put mankind in control over everything that we see in this world? He gave us authority. And you know what? With authority and control comes great responsibility. That's where free will comes into play. And yes, that's a part of the Christmas story because you know it. The moment that God gave us free will, we have the choice to make good and we have the choice to make bad of things. And unfortunately, bad people make bad choices. And you know what? Good people can make bad choices as well. And this brings in the point of why God needed to bring about redemption, why God needed to bring about restoration, because there was a spiritual separation. When sin entered into the world, what happened, right? There was a separation between God and man. And because there was separation, how would there be reconciliation? Well, that's God's plan of redemption and restoration. He wants to redeem us, and he wants to restore that relationship. Now, when we begin to think about how God was going to make all of this happen, you need to understand this because this is a really powerful point. For God to bring about redemption, for God to bring about restoration, God needed a body because the world that he created here, humanity was created and given a body. See, spirits are eternal and don't have bodies. That's why the Bible tells us that when we are to be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord. See, the body will go to the grave and the spirit will be forever because that is the eternal part of who we are. So Satan, when he brought in temptation, he was a spirit. He needed a body to possess in order to bring about his evil plan. What did he do? He possessed the snake. And you know what? He's still possessing things today. I just got to go out and say it. I really think he's still possessing mosquitoes and he's possessing gnats. And he's possessing a person or two from here or there. Man, just had to think about those mosquitoes this time of year. I wish he'd get a little cooler so he could do that. But God needed a body. Satan needed that just the same. And through Jesus, God was going to restore our authority. He was going to restore our relationship So Jesus had to be born. And this is where it comes in. Christmas is coming in Genesis. We see that God created us in his image. We see the fall of man where we we, we took the bait and sin entered the world. And then in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 where God is talking to Satan. He says, I'm going to put enmity or hostility between you and the woman. And between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And this is where Christmas began. God is forecasting that one day there is going to be one who comes. He is going to come in the form of a man. And he would bring about the plan of God to bring redemption and restoration. So can I take it a little further this morning with you and say, well, how does God redeem and how does God restore? Well, we made it clear that sin is what separates us. And the word redemption means to buy out. And so our sin and the record of all of the charges against us were there. It's like a long receipt, as I've told you before at CVS. And everything that I've ever done wrong is on that receipt. And Satan is there to condemn me of those things and make me feel guilty of those things. But when Jesus came, he took sin upon himself. And the Bible says it like this in in Corinthians. It tells us that he became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. And Colossians tells us that he canceled the record of charges that were against us when he nailed it to the cross. So the plan of redemption really looks like this. Jesus was ultimately born to die. And so he would bring about the plan of redemption and restoration by being born, taking on the form of a man, going to the cross and giving up his life. Ultimately, what Jesus was going to do here was restore our relationship with him. 
You see, back when Adam and Eve sinned, they were expelled or exiled from the garden. And because they were exiled, there would then be a need to be reconciled. They were exiled, but needed reconciliation. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 tells us this. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. That is the man, intentionality, the man, Jesus Christ. Because if Jesus didn't take on the form of a man, there would be no mediator. There would be no one to stand between me and God and reconcile us in relationship. Go all the way to the cross when Jesus was hanging there and he took his last breath. The Bible tells us that the veil was torn in two. That is what separated the holy place and the most holy place where God's presence was. And when the veil was torn in two, you and I now had access to Jesus and intimacy was restored. The final fourth purpose of the birth of Jesus is to reveal God's purpose to us. And ultimately, you know you hear me say this all the time. God's purpose for us is to have a personal relationship with Him. You see, God created a family, and He wants you in it. Did you know that? God wanted a family, and He wants you to be in it. You know, John chapter 15, verse 16 says this. It says, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit. See, God wants to walk in relationship with you. He's not distant. He cares this morning. He's not this judgmental and condemning God. He's a God who came to, comes to save. He's a God who came in love. He's a God who came to reveal himself to you so that you would know who God is. I bring this to a close this morning. As you're sitting there with your families, sitting there with gifts around the tree, or maybe they're already open by this time, and maybe there's been a moment where you exchange gifts. And what I want you to know in this moment, as you're sitting there with your families, is that Jesus brought about a gift exchange for us. I want you to take this in because it's a powerful, powerful point for you to get. See, Jesus exchanged our sin for his forgiveness. Jesus exchanged the curses on our life for his blessings. Jesus exchanged our spiritual poverty for his spiritual riches. Jesus exchanged your rejection, my rejection, for his acceptance. And Jesus exchanged our shame for his glory. He exchanged our death for his life. Jesus exchanged our emptiness for purpose and meaning. He exchanged our hopelessness. Come on, church. He exchanged our hopelessness for his hope. And Jesus wants you this morning to change your past for his future. Can I say that again? He wants you to exchange your past for his future. And I just wonder if you're sitting right there, if you're willing to accept the gift that Jesus revealed to us. For God so loved the world that he gave a gift. And he wants to exchange all of those things for your life this morning. The most important thing you can do this morning as you're sitting there with your family is give your life to Jesus. Accept that gift of salvation. Accept the reason for the season is that Jesus came for you and your family. I want to close us for, with prayer this morning. And I remind you that the birth of Jesus, it teaches us that nothing is impossible for God. No matter where you're at, no matter what you've gone through, no matter the emotions that you experience in this season, God's got a plan for your life. God's got a purpose for your life. And God loves you this morning. Would you bow your heads right where you're at with me this morning and let me pray for you? Lord Jesus, this morning, as they're sitting right there in that place, if they need to give their life to you this morning, I pray that, Lord, they would turn their life over to you and accept this gift of salvation. That you so loved us that you gave your life for us. I pray, Lord, that you would touch their families, encourage them in this Christmas season. Help them to soak all this in and reflect on this message with their family. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Once again, on behalf of Chantal and I, we want to wish you and your family a very Merry Christmas. If you gave your life to Jesus, if God is speaking to you in this message, would you just comment there in the comment section? Would you like and subscribe to our YouTube channel? Would you share this with friends and family? And we hope you have the best Christmas ever. We love y'all and can't wait to see you back in person.